gathered here to praise his name that the, we would have this spiritual awakening in our lives that he's here to save us if we just let him empower us to do so oh, that was great uh, just in case you didn't know we're going to do that song again and you're going to help us next time and that's going to be this morning yet so so we've been taking time in the book of ephesians I think we'll make it perhaps in 10 weeks through ephesians we come to our uh, middle point as we come to kind of the fifth of the uh, series today in Ephesians. And we've been talking a lot about uh, the racial divide that exists in our, our world today. And for you and I, we come to these kind of issues with a, well, with, with our own set of presumptions, right? We're Americans, all of us, and for Americans, kind of this concept or this idea of equal rights under the law is you know, well enshrined in our traditions. It's a deeply held ethic, you know. It goes back to the Declaration of Independence, right, where it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? It's a, it's a big statement that is still, I think, fairly well uh, passed along. We know that's there. 
It wasn't until the Constitution itself was adopted some 11 years later that uh, individual rights were granted, right? And, and lined out, you know, these are your rights and the li government limited in its influence over daily life. That was in 1787, but it took until 1870 for the 15th Amendment to take those same rights and apply them to Negro men and allow them a vote. Not only that, it wasn't until almost 40 years later that women were allowed to vote. Perhaps most well known for our state, our country's history was the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which kind of codified the, the uh, made it illegal, right, to discriminate on the basis of sex, race, color, national origin, or religion. But before all of those documents that have shaped our country were founded, before they were even thought of, right, it was God's plan, clear from the very beginning, that Gentiles and Jews, which is the way that they described everyone, right, Jews were one group and Gentiles were everybody else. When it uses those phrases together, it talks, it's talking about all men who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. They share equally. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessing because they belong to Christ Jesus in Christ. You get it? All men have the same blessing. They have the same Access. Every person, Jew or Gentile, matters to God. And they should all matter to us. And they clearly mattered to Paul. And you read these verses in the third chapter of Ephesians, and his letter kind of takes this topic head on in chapter 2, and in verse chapter 3, he begins to move away from it. Kind of starts, you know, to, he begins to pray for them. And before he prays for them, he describes him self with this phrase. He begins to pray and he describes himself as a, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of the Gentiles. And all of a sudden he realizes, wait a minute, I'm not sure I've said everything I need to say about this Jew and Gentile division. And so we come back to it again today. And Paul, as he writes, makes it really clear that God's plan is the same for everyone. And really, it's the same from the beginning to the end. It's hard for us to think about the Old Testament and work the cross in there, but we read about Christ's sacrifice, and we realize that Christ's sacrifice was really the sacrifice that paid for the sins of all men, even those that died without ever hearing of the cross. For Paul, for Paul personally, you got to know that this represents a huge change of thinking in his own mind, in his own heart. At one time, he would have been, well, a very, very Jewish kind of guy with really strong Jewish prejudices. He would have viewed every other race as, well, dirty and disgusting. Now he describes himself with that phrase, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles. And he seems to take this mention of his imprisonment. It's almost like he's writing there in prison, and, uh, and you know, the, he hears the chain fastened to his wall and to his leg rattle a little bit. And a reminder of his imprisonment takes him back to this defining moment for his life, for this key issue, this, this reason that he's there. He just can't help himself. He kind of got to take another look at that amazing change that's happened. He says, assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. And as you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. And God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by his spirit he has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. And he says, listen, 
All those things, the things that we didn't understand when we read the Old Testament, all that mystery about who God is, a coming king and a suffering savior, a chosen people and a God for all the earth, all those things. You're like, oh, wait, how can this be? Well, he says, let me tell you how. And I've been describing it. He makes it very clear that the, the mystery is history, right? You look back over where, from where he stands and where we sit today. And you can look back to the cross and you can see how God solved all of those contradictions in his prophetic word and in, in his description of his coming Messiah and in the picture of his intention for the earth. All those mysteries, right? And the revelation that brought it all together is that phrase, both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. That means that the, the person nearby and the person far away from you can become your brothers and sisters. It means that that invitation that you've responded to that is described as God's grace, his work accomplished by the cross, is an open plan that others can buy into. And when you look at other people, you look at them differently. Right? It's Paul, right? Paul lived this plan. Right, it's all about his history, his life. Remember, he was an up-and-coming Jewish leader. He had been given authority to go persecute these upstart Christians that had begun to just spread their talk about Jesus all over the place. He'd been on his way to go to Damascus to arrest followers of Christ. It was in that moment that Paul's life was radically changed as he encounters the living Christ, and there in a vision he hears the truth and realizes that Christ not only is alive from the dead, but he is who he said he was. And in that moment, his life is totally changed, right? As a result of that experience, God sends another follower of his to minister to Paul. And as Ananias is sent to go to him, he's sent with kind of these instructions. The Lord says to Ananias, go for Saul, later called Paul, is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So all of a sudden, this man who was hell-bent on persecuting Christians, on stopping the good news from spreading, becomes God's chosen instrument. He still cared about his Jewish brothers and sisters outside the, uh, the faith, but his ministry focuses on Gentiles. In new cities, Paul often went to the synagogue first, expecting to find those people with a history of God's work, wanting to call out those who God had chosen from those congregations. But almost always it ends up in kind of community centers and places where the Gentiles and the rest of the people of the town gathered. And he found his most responsive audiences among the Gentiles. And the churches that gathered together, he appointed Gentile leaders to serve there. He defended the Gentiles against uh, those Jewish believers who were, well, trying to make them Jews, not just Christians. And it's in his ministry among the Gentiles that has resulted in his imprisonment, right? That's why he describes himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles. I don't have time to go into the whole story of how that happened, about how he was uh, charged and uh, identified because of this Gentile connection. But it's an illustration of how committed Paul was to the plan. To share the good news, not just with the Jews, but the Gentiles also. He had clearly embraced God's priorities. The grace of God for all the people of the earth. He's willing to pay whatever personal price was demanded of him for the amazing privilege of extending God's grace to the Gentiles. In, in some sense, he has kind of a stewardship perspective. He realizes what he's been given, the amazing riches, right, of this not only insight, but of the, of the grace of, of God, of 
Christ's sacrifice, how rich it is, how amazing it is, and he wants to share it. He wants to give it away. So many of those things we often think of, oh, we need to hoard them. Right? We, wouldn't, we wouldn't want them to know how good God is. <laughs> Not Paul, right? He embraces God's priorities. It's ultimately God's plan that unites believers, right? It's, it is the sense of this mystery that once was hidden, how God could be the God of the whole earth and still the God of the Jews. How, how God could be there to bless the entire world and yet the Jews be the chosen people, right? God brought them together. It's that mysterious plan regarding Christ, his insight regarding Christ. He sees it and he's excited to share it. He understands it. He's got a glimpse of it. He wants other people to see it so they'd share it too. It's the same for all of us. He just talks about all those things, right, that we share together. We talked about some of those pictures last week. He makes another list of them this week. There's this series of pictures that binds you together with other believers, binds the Gentile to the, the Jews. There is a, an inheritance, right? It says both Jews, Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally and the riches inherited by God's children. You think about an inheritance. What is, what is that? That's from a family, a family member to their descendants, to the people that they're connected to. And those that share an inheritance, in a sense, share a family. That family kind of connection. Right? I talked about that last week. How That is not always the easiest connection in our lives. For many of you, I know that it's within your own families that you've dealt with some of the most difficult issues. It's how to care for families. You know, you, you have to care. You don't have a choice. And, and you do care, and yet to know how best to express that care is, is really tough. Not, nothing has been more difficult in many people's experience, mine included, than family relationships. But the, the inheritance says that there is a good thing that comes to all within the family. An inheritance binds us together. A, a body binds us together. It's a, little, uh, it's a little funny to think about, right? We're both parts of the same body, that kind of issue. But the connection and the interdependence and that kind of issue. And what's a body designed to do? It's, an, it's designed to do, right? It's designed to work. It's designed to function together. It's Diverse, different parts, works in different ways, and it's interdependent. Right? You need all the pieces in your body to work together. It's, it's a picture, right, of what we share together. We share a task that we're involved in. And the health of everyone really around the earth in terms of its whole body, but even in our local expression, you really need to be healthy because we need you. And you need to pray for those next to you because you need them. We need them to be, well, healthy and strong and able to do what God has designed them to do. God's plan unites us together, right? We share a body. We share a promise, right? It says both enjoy the promise of blessing because they belong to Christ Jesus. What, what's a promise? A promise is God's esteem, it's a sense that he looks at you and he says, you are worth my investment. I, I, you, you are valuable. Promise. You think of the Old Testament promises that God gave to Israel, right? We talk about a promised land, right? But it was more than just a promised land. It was a promised presence. You'll be my people. I will be your God. It was, you know, a promise of forgiveness and all of those other kind of symbols of God's activity among them, that there is a way that joined them together. They were distinctive because they were people of God's promise. The promise sets our agenda for our hearts. It tells us what to love and what to look forward to. A promise. We're joined together by a promise. God's plan. It's the same. It's the same for our church here in Princeton. It's the same for the church gathered in America. It extends us, our hearts out to the church gathered around the world. That's why often when we pray, we think of places where, well, those living as Christians, identified as Christians in faraway places, are in difficult circumstances. And 
and the object of, well, people's hate and their uh, targets of their anger. God's plan's the same for us and for them. We're together. We share this together. It should break down the barriers, right, between people. It's supposed to. It's supposed to be the antidote for racism and prejudices, all of those things. In a sense, God's plans for the same one and God's purpose expressed here motivates our obedience. Just like Paul, right? His world was changed when he encountered Christ with a crucified and living one. All of a sudden began to reshape how we thought about people in really practical life-shaping ways. Said this, said, I am the least deserving of all of God's people. He graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. When Paul uses this word least, he takes the normal Greek word for least and he adds an unusual ending to it. It's almost like he says to them, I am the leastest, right? It's kind of hard to say that, the leastest of all of them. And later on, he, when he uses his name Paul, the Latin name, okay, I know a lot of word backgrounds here. The Latin name for Paul, Paulus, right, means small. So some people think as he's writing this that the idea is, he's saying something like, I'm little by name and little by stature and morally I am littler than the least of all Christians. He's almost saying, I am small Paul, right? I'm small Paul, you and I, we think, well, that's not really how we think of him, you know. We have him clear up, up here on this huge pedestal. But in his day, in the ministry that Paul is writing to them, he, he actually comes with this, well, a, a little bit of a handicap as he ministers to people. He is, first of all, short, right? He is small in the physical sense. And there seems to be some physical impairment. Some people say that it's his eyes, that his eyes were just not right. So here he comes, this little guy, and he's got this roomy, weepy eyes, or they're red and discolored. His face just isn't right because of his eyes. And so when he comes in person, he's kind of unimpressive. And only his message. And it's only because the Spirit takes his message and makes it real. Small. I'm the least. Maybe Paul knows it. He knows that there is a big barrier for his personal appeal. But somehow, the message that he carries, the message that he's been given, the message he's living out, still is able to. To penetrate. I think it's because of Christ's life. The reality of Christ's work focused not only his heart, but that's its impact in the hearts of other people. Paul talks about that. And he describes it as this gracious privilege of telling the Gentiles. He has a message, and it's in that message that all of a sudden their hearts are drawn not to the man. Right? The man is, a, is almost a problem in this communication thing. For Paul, he's no longer under his own control, right? He's, he's willing to be Christ's prisoner. He's, he is dedicated to this message of Christ's impact through the cross and his resurrection. He's directed by Christ's purpose for him. His, his heart has been refocused, but that message is intended to refocus each heart. Not, not only across, right, this Jewish-Gentile divide, but from you, from your heart to the people around you. It's a refocusing kind of message. When you get it, when you receive it, when it, it penetrates, the deeper it goes, the more it changes how you look at others. That's true for us. we are all been given a message God's grace is real for each of us, and we each are messengers, even though we have different kinds of methods that it's communicated. Christ's life, well, refocuses hearts. 
And that part of that refocus is, is expressed in obedience. In a sense that we, we have Christ's life in us and we live differently. We live differently because of it. For Paul, he lived very differently. For you and I, the different ways we live are unique, right? They're your ways. But God's purpose in Paul and God's purpose in you is the same. And it's described this way. God's purpose in all this, right, in his saving work, in his redirecting work, in the work in his heart, God's purpose is to use the church. And when you think of church, I want you to think me and the rest of us gathered together in worship and in honor of his name. The church describes all believers, Jew, Gentile, you and every other one like you whose hearts have been touched by God's grace. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Let me read you just a, a description written by another pastor of what's going on here. Picture in your mind a great and wise painter painting on a huge canvas with many brushes, most of them very ordinary and messy. The painter is God, so you can't picture him, but he's invisible. But he intends for his painting to be visible, to be a, the visible display of his wisdom. He knows people can't see him, but he wants his wisdom to be seen and admired. His, hand, his canvas is huge. It's the size of the created universe. I know you really can't imagine looking at that canvas because you're in it, but do your best. And God is painting with thousands and thousands of colors and shades and textures. A picture as big as the universe and as old as creation and as lasting as eternity. A picture we call history. With the central drama being the preparation, salvation, and formation of the church of Jesus Christ. And he is using thousands of different brushes. Most of them very ordinary and very small because every minute detail is crucial in the painting to display his wisdom, the wisdom of the painter. And these brushes are God's people of every generation. Wisdom That's, of God might be displayed, and the, the word is really literally a many-colored wisdom. Whether that's the, the physical races involved in it, or the different personalities or individuals. You each carry a part of that picture. And you're each intended to be seen, to be a display of our wise God. And how is it displayed? In your response to him. You see, it, you add to God's glory in your daily obedience. Hmm. And that's the wonder for all eternity. God's wisdom and the demonstration of his goodness, the, the uh, impact of his grace, the amazing work of his sacrifice will be the wonder for all of eternity. God's amazing love poured out over underserving people, changing their hearts and those hearts responding to him in obedience. And God's purpose finally enables confidence. We looked at that verse as, as we prayed today, and it says it's because of Christ and of his faithful, uh, and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. So don't lose heart because of my trials here. I'm suffering here, and you should feel honored because of Christ. His cross, his enduring life, there is, well, resources for us. Because of Christ, even Paul's trials could serve as demonstrations of his glory. So it's true for you and I that the glory of God often calls for sacrifice on our parts. Ultimately, even Paul's imprisonment was for their honor, someone who loved them so much that he was willing to suffer imprisonment, to be obedient, and to take the message to them that don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. There is access that comes by faith because of Christ. Right? That's the kind of God we have. That's the kind of God, if you ever wonder if 
God cares about you. He hears your prayers. You just have to go back to the cross to that moment and see a God who loved you that much. You come by faith. You say, I realize who you are. I know what you've done. And so not because of my own activities, but because of your provision, we come. It's access. Finally, our circumstances become opportunities for his glory. Even in imprisonment, right, for Paul. So you deal with where you're at today. With your heart before the God, before, with your mistakes that you've made, with the sins, perhaps, that need to be forgiven. Those things come. And those times come for all of us. It's, it's equal for each one of us. Equal opportunity Christianity means that all of God's children share a place in his plan. Equal opportunity Christianity means that all of his followers honor him in their obedience. We're significant. We're witnesses for him. His servants then find all that they need for life and for godliness. It's access. It's access. Equal opportunities comes to you. Not just someone else that has an opportunity to come. And it's not just you. It's an earth full of followers who've been impacted by his grace. So we need to open our hearts to others. We need to open our lives so that people can see God's goodness, the impact that he's made. Perhaps other people will actually ask the reason for the hope that's in you. And you can tell them about a cross where Christ died, not just for you, not just to purchase your forgiveness, but for them and for a hope and a future that God has for them too. It's equal opportunity. It's for you. It's for your neighbor. It's for those in far off countries. It's why we send missionaries, but it's also why you and I Look to those around us with different eyes and different hearts. Well, Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for that, for the open door that you have given, the equal opportunity that we can come, that we can come, just like those in previous generations and that those around the world can come and share as our brothers and sisters in your amazing grace. So Lord, I pray again that you would encourage us with not only your plan and your purpose, but boldness to come for your honor and for your glory. In your name I ask it. Amen. So this week's a little different for us. I'm, Gene and I plan to leave this afternoon for our district retreat in Colorado. Bye. But uh, we are uh, looking forward to that. But other issues that you have, struggles that you have, you're welcome to... Just pull one of your friends aside, a brother here in church or sister here in church, and say, would you pray with me uh, about this? Or as I return this Friday, then perhaps it would be a time that we could get together and uh, we could pray together about that which the Lord has laid on your heart. Our closing hymn is number 186, and it talks about the church's one foundation. And remember when we are singing about the church, we're singing about the gathering of all of Christ's followers. Not, not, the, not that the building has a good foundation, not that the structures physically that we're in. It's the people that God has built together on the foundation of Christ's work. I want you to stand and we'll sing just the first and last verses. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Verse 4. Yet she on earth hath union with God, the three in one, and mystic sweet communion.
union with those whose rest is one. O happy ones and holy, Lord, give us grace that we, like them, the meek and lowly, shall I may dwell with thee. And now as Paul finally gets to his prayer for the Ephesians, his prayer includes this benediction. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us to him, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. May you go in peace. Again, let me remind the elders that we're going to gather in just a couple minutes in the office.